I think we've uh, the previous two Bible studies we looked at the seven signs of the Holy Ghost. We looked at seven different signs of the Holy Ghost. We looked at uh, speaking in tongues, prophesying. We looked at testifying of Jesus. That was the third sign. We looked at peace, a supernatural peace which surpasses all understanding. We looked at how we have the ability to love God, how we have the ability to love mankind when the Spirit of God is in us. We looked at how one of the signs of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that we have a desire to keep the commandments of God and how there's a conviction when we manage not to keep the commandments of God. And then, of course, in our last study, we looked at how there's boldness, how there's a zeal to build the kingdom of God. And we looked at the story of Haggai. So there's two more signs that we will look at before we close on this study of the signs of the Holy Ghost. You may be asking, why are we doing so much on the Holy Ghost? Remember, I think a few weeks ago, it was the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost signified the time when the Holy Spirit came upon uh, the disciples and that was a very monumental and significant day in the in the uh, the period of the church and it's still important today because we must always remember that without the holy spirit we cannot do anything so there's there should always be that yearning to have a life uh, which is filled with the holy spirit and i think there are things that we can do to ensure that the holy spirit is in our lives and one of those things we're going to be talking about quite deeply today but before we look at that ninth sign of the holy ghost in in our lives let's look at the eighth sign the eighth sign is that when the spirit of god is in our lives we become very mindful of spiritual things we spend most of our time rather than thinking about carnal things things that are in this world uh there's a difference between let me say carnal things and worldly things carnal things are things that pertain to your flesh Carnal things are usually lustful type of things, whereas worldly things, worldly things, the Bible says that uh, it is not only the lust of the flesh, but it's also the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. A worldly thing might be always being concerned about money, always being concerned about possessions, always being concerned about your status, always being concerned about promotion. Those are worldly things, whereas when you talk about carnal things, Usually you're talking about lustful things. Usually you're talking about things that your flesh desires and that your flesh needs. But one of the marks of somebody that is born again, one of the marks of somebody that walks in the spirit of God is that they become less mindful about these carnal and these worldly things. And they start to think and meditate upon the word of God. More often, they start to meditate upon revelation about uh, about Jesus Christ, they start to meditate upon revelations that actually come in the past, prophetic things that are written in the Bible. Above all, they start to meditate on the kingdom of God. Remember, Jesus even told the disciples, this is even before they received the Holy Spirit, he told them that they should seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And this is what happens when we receive the Holy Spirit. We're always seeking after righteousness. We're always meditating and thinking, how, in what way can I become more righteous? We're always thinking about the kingdom of God. We're thinking about preparing to make sure that we don't miss the mark of the kingdom, preparing ourselves to not only get into the kingdom of God, but to also get there with great glory, to also get there with approval from Jesus Christ, knowing that we have done our calling, we've done our mission, and that we've done it to a good enough standard, knowing that we feared God, knowing that we've kept his commandments, knowing that we've done the best that we could do in our ministry, we've helped people, we've edified people, that now becomes a concern for somebody that has the Holy Spirit. It was not a concern before. We may have even been religious. We may have gone to buildings that we call churches, where, whereas we know that the church is not a building. The building, the, the church is actually the, 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 um, the collection of believers that is what the church actually stands for the church is not a specific building but we may have gone to church in the past but we were not spiritual we were not spiritually minded we were carnally minded and paul talks about the difference between the carnal man and the spiritual man in romans chapter 8 paul talks about how to be carnally minded is to be at enmity with god 
And he says that the reason why we are at enmity with God when we are carnally minded is because, excuse me, is because the carnal man does not care about the commandments of God. The carnal man, not only does he not care about the commandments of God as a result of having no care for the commandments of God, he will not subject himself under those commandments. In fact, the way in which he will conduct himself will be against God's commandments. Okay? But a spiritually minded person has a life of peace. A spiritually minded person can actually align himself in God's commandments. And the Bible actually says in, in that same chapter in Romans 8, that those who are led by the spirit, the same are the sons of God. So we get to a place that we're not only being spiritually minded, we're not only concerning our minds with spiritual things, but we are also being led by the spirit of God. We're going to even a step, far, a step further. We are letting God's spirit direct us into the decisions that we make, the things that we choose not to do, and also the things that we say. We're, we're letting the spirit of God take a central role in the decisions that we make in life. And that is a sign that we have the Holy Ghost. That is a sign that we are spiritually minded. Okay, so what, what is the carnal mind? What is the worldly mind concerned with? Well, Paul gives us a glimpse of this in Colossians chapter 3. We can start off in the first verse, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. If I can find it. Okay, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1. It says, if you be risen with Christ, in other words, if you have received the Holy Spirit, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Okay, what are the things that are above? Okay, Paul says in one place, he says that the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The things that are above are the things that are not seen. These things they are concerned virtue, they concern holiness, wisdom, knowledge, revelation. Okay, who can see knowledge? Who can see wisdom? Who can see who can see revelation? These are not things that are tangible. Love. Now you might see them in, or you might see them, these qualities through people. You might see somebody who is wise. You might see somebody who has revelation. But these qualities are almost like spirits. These qualities are eternal. And that's why in, I believe it's in Isaiah how it talks about the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. These are spirits. And these things are eternal these things are not visible because as paul said the things which are not seen are eternal but the things that are seen are temporal so when paul is saying seek those things which are above he's talking about these type of qualities he's talking about these type of treasures it's similar to jesus which we'll look at actually later on where jesus said in in matthew 5 he said that seek not after treasures which rust and which can be stolen, but seek after treasures which are above, which cannot be stolen, which cannot corrupt. Again, what are those treasures? Those treasures are these qualities that we can possess. Those treasures are those qualities which we should aspire to grow in, namely wisdom, love, peace, Morning in progress, revelation, etc. Okay, so that brings clarity to what Paul says when he says, seek those things which are above. Okay, another thing which is above is eternal life. Another thing which is above is God. God is above. So seek after God. And in fact, that is the way in which you will be able to acquire all of those treasures. You acquire wisdom, you acquire revelation, eternal life, 
peace, knowledge, revelation, all these things, you acquire all these treasures when you acquire God. Because all of these attributes, all of these treasures which I have spoken of, they find themselves in God. So when you have God, you have all of these gifts. It says in James that every good and perfect gift comes from God, the Father of light, in whom there is no variableness. Okay, so the gifts that I've mentioned here come from God. And when you have that intimate relationship with God, God fills you up with his spirit. God fills you up, him, fills you up with himself. And then you are able to you're able to develop all of these attributes which I've just spoken of. Just give me one second. Sorry, someone's just asking for the link. Let me just send it to them now. All right. So verses two. So Colossians chapter three, verses two. It says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What that means is that your emotions should not be found in things that are in this world. The fact that, let's say, God forbid, but let's say you lose some money, that should not affect you. It says, set not your affections on things of this world. The things of this world should not affect you. That's where we get this term affection. It should not affect you. Okay, God forbid your friends leave you, your family depart from you. That should not affect you anymore. It used to affect you when you're in the world. Those type of matters, those type of situations, those predicaments would affect you. But they don't affect you anymore because Christ is in you. And the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he, is, than he that is in the world. And because you've got Christ, you know that you have the most important thing. All the other things, as we mentioned before, going back to Paul's scripture, the things that are seen, the things that are in this world, what are they? They are temporal. They're all going to go. It's like my dad always reminds me, the money that we make, can we take it with us where we're going? The possessions that we have that are in this world, can we take them with us when we're going to the grave? We'll all, we'll all go to the grave. So why should we set our affection on these things? Our affection should be on the things that are eternal. Like what? Like our soul. We should be more concerned about the health of our soul. We should be more concerned about where are we going? What, what is going to happen to our soul when we die? Our affection should be more about our current relationship with God. Where do we stand with God? Are we praying as we did before? Are we reading that scripture, the Bible, as we did before? Is our relationship with God wobbly? Or is our relationship with God strong? Is our relationship with God improving? Or are we becoming further away from God as the, day, as the days go by? That is where our affection ought to be. Our affection ought not to be in what he said or what she said. Our affection not ought to be on sports. Our affection not ought to be on fashion, on music. Our affection not ought to be on just making money. Our affection, our emotions should be more on God. We shouldn't be getting upset easily unless it's because something's wrong in our spiritual life. We shouldn't even be getting so joyful or happy unless, again, it is something which is concerning our spiritual life. The things of this world should not move us. I'm not saying that we have good days and bad days and those days are often influenced by the things that are around us. But what Paul is saying here is that when we become spiritually mature, we start to become very immovable. And the things that happen around us don't really affect our emotions as they did before. Me before, I can remember a few years ago where I could, I could be in a relationship, 
friends or even a romantic relationship. And those things could really affect me. They could affect my day. They could affect my outlook. They could affect my emotions. I've got to a stage now where I am in Christ, where it is very difficult to affect me. It's very, very difficult. It's even, it even gets to the stage, I believe, that you can be, you become so strong in Christ that let's say, God forbid, somebody in your family passed away. You wouldn't, it wouldn't even move you that much. Because you'll know, like Paul was trying to tell the people in uh, Thessalonians, he said, he was trying to tell the church, he was trying to encourage them that, look, if they've died, they've died in Christ. They're, they're only sleeping. They're not really dead. You will still see them again in the resurrection. You will see them in the resurrection. And that is the stage that, that Paul got to where the things that happened in the world really didn't move him at all. And you can see this in his letters because many of his letters, he's writing them in prison. He's, and, and the prisons that they had in those days are completely different to the, to the prisons that we have today. They were squalid conditions. Squalid conditions. They didn't have a sanitary system like we had where we have today where we could go to a toilet, flush the toilet. They didn't have the food. They didn't have the medical advancements that we have today. So prison was a, was a terrible thing in those days. And yet Paul is writing in Philippians and saying that I've learned that in whatsoever situation I have been to be content. I've had experiences where I've abounded and I've had experiences where I've had very little, but I've learned to praise God in whatever circumstance I am in. See, that is a sign of, of somebody who has not set their affection on things of this world. And this is only possible if you have the spirit. This is only possible if you're spiritually minded. If you are carnally minded, then you're going to be tossed to, to and fro like a boat in the midst of a stormy sea. That is how your life is going to be. Because in this world, things change. Things go up, things go down. Okay, in this world, it's like how it was in, in the time of Joseph. There might be seven years of plenty. There might be seven years of famine. Okay, things go up and down. Okay. But with God, with Christ, with Christ, there's stability. With Christ, there's peace. That's why when, uh, when there was a storm, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was walking on the water. He was walking on the water. And when Peter was looking at Jesus, focused on Jesus, his eyes fixed on Jesus, even Peter, he was, he was able to walk on the water in the middle of a storm. The moment Peter started looking around, he lost focus of Jesus. He began to sink. That shows what happens when you're worldly, when your eyes are not fixed on Jesus. Because to put, to put it simply, to be carnally minded or to be worldly, what it means is when your eyes are not on Jesus, when your eyes are looking at other things, when you're, when you're focused on anything else but Jesus. And when that happens, you, you be like Peter, you start sinking, you start being anxious, you start being frightened like Peter was. And yet Jesus says to his disciples, he says, do not think that by being anxious, by, by being so worried that you can add one inch to your stature, you can add one inch or one cubit, he says in, in, King, in King James Version, one cubit to your stature. You can't change anything by worrying. In fact, maybe things are even getting worse by worrying. So Jesus gives them the, the antidote to live a life free of anxiety, to live a life whereby worry doesn't weigh upon you. And he said, look, don't, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Look at the, the birds. God feeds them. They don't sow, neither do they reap, but God feeds them. Look at the, the flowers. God dresses the flowers, even in apparel, which exceeds the clothes that King Solomon wore. So what did Jesus say to the disciples? He said, this is what your focus ought to be on. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and these things will be added onto you. That is what spiritually minded people seek. They are looking for righteousness, number one. They're always learning about what righteousness is and they're always looking to incorporate righteousness into their lives. Because okay, spiritually minded people are not hypocritical. Okay, spiritually minded people, they, they what they want to do is they want to practice what they preach. They don't want to come and preach one thing and then when nobody's not watching, then live an entirely different life. Because when the spirit of God is within you, God will convict you. In fact, God will, will make it known to you if he thinks that you're living hypocritically. So spiritually minded people are always concerned about being a righteous person, always showing always teaching people by not by not by what they preach or teach alone but teaching people by how they conduct themselves because that is the best way to teach somebody by by proving your worth by the way in which you conduct yourself but a spiritually minded person is also concerned about seeking the kingdom of god and what it means really to seek the kingdom of god is that you want to enter into god's kingdom you want to enter into heaven. You don't take it for granted. You don't have this, uh, this, this complacency that, look, just because I believe in Jesus, that's it, I'm going to heaven. I think what spiritually minded people do is they fear God. I think what spiritually minded people do, just like Paul, is that they work out their salvation with fear and with trembling. The Bible even talks about Jesus, that, that Jesus feared God, and that is why he obeyed God onto the cross. And remember, there was a time when Peter was trying to defend Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus said, don't, don't defend me. Do not think I can call down 12 legions of angels. And I think what that means is Jesus could have escaped. Jesus didn't need to go onto the cross. We kind of look at it as if Jesus was a robot, and Jesus didn't have, you know, many people give this view, oh, yeah, Jesus is just God, he's God, he's this, he's that, you know, he was just, he was just God. My view of Christ is that Christ was like us. Christ actually had the free will. Christ didn't, didn't have to go to the cross if he didn't want to. But Christ knew why he had to go to the cross. Christ knew that it was a commandment to go to the cross. And the Bible says in Hebrews that he went to the cross because he feared God. And in fact, you see, you see the dialogue between him and the father in the garden. He's saying, God, take this cup away from me. I can't do it. It's too, it's too unbearable. He was going through so much pain, even before the cross. He was going through a sort of, we, maybe we never really understand it, but something was going on in this, it, spiritually to him. Something was, was going on that was tremendously painful for him the bible says he was praying he began to sweat blood as he was praying he was in so much anguish angels had to come and strengthen him this is before he was killed and in the midst of that jesus said not my will but let your will be done god clarified to him again because jesus was almost second guessing is this really god's will why would god want me to suffer the way i'm suffering me who has kept his law, me who has kept it perfectly. Let me see, is this re does, does G God really want me to go ahead with this? Because this cup is too much. He said, not my will, but let your will be done. He knew at that time, yes, it is God's will for me to go to the cross. Because I fear him, I have to obey him. Look at uh, Abraham, another spiritually minded person. Again, what am I talking about? I'm talking about complacency. People who are spiritually minded are not complacent. We don't just think, oh, because I confess Jesus, that's it. I'm going to heaven. The Bible says many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, 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 have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not cast out devils in your name? These are believers. These are not the people in the world. These are people that go to church. These are people that attend Bible study. These are people, some of them that even preach the gospel. These are people that cast out devils. These are people that prophesy. How scary is that? Jesus didn't, wasn't talking about the world. He was talking about believers. There. He said, many will come in that day saying, I've done this. He said, depart from me. I never knew you. Look at Abraham. Abraham 
was told by God, take up your son, Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice. And as he was about to do, an angel of the Lord spoke to him and said, don't touch the boy. Now I know you fear me. So spiritually minded people seeking righteousness, but they're also seeking to enter into God's kingdom. They're not being complacent. They're not thinking, oh, I'm getting in because I go to church. I'm getting in because I do a Bible study. No, no, no. They're thinking that, look, I have to, I have to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so let's look at some final scriptures uh, before we move on to the last sign the Holy Ghost is in your life. Again, this eighth sign is that somebody who has the Holy Spirit is more mindful of spiritual things. Okay, before we were born again, the Bible says that we were under the, the God of this world. We fought like the God of this world. We spoke like the God of this world. But now the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things of the past are old and behold, all things become new. And one of the things that become new is your mindset. Your mindset becomes more spiritual. Your mindset starts to meditate on God's word, meditate on righteousness. And you start to fear the prospect of going to hell. That's a spiritually minded person. Somebody who thinks about hell, who thinks about heaven, those are, that's a spiritually minded person. Because you'll be surprised. Many people live their life as if they're going to live on this earth forever. They live this life as if all the money they make, they can enjoy it forever. And they very rarely think about death until, let's say, maybe somebody dies in their family or until they're on the deathbed. And then that's when they cry out to God. But somebody who has the Holy Spirit is not like that. We don't think about death on the deathbed alone. We think about death whenever it, whenever God reminds us that, look, the time on the earth is, is short and that you have to make the most of that time. And what we ought to do is to seek after righteousness and the kingdom of God. Jesus even said, if you seek after righteousness and the kingdom of God, all other things will be added unto you. All the things in this world because the, the things in this world are not some of the things in the world are not bad not everything in the world is bad money is not a bad thing don't think i'm saying money is a bad thing relationships that you can have in this world are not bad some of them are good okay but what jesus is saying is that that ought not to be the focus the primary focus with the little time that's been allocated Remember, we're not like our forefathers who lived 700, 600, 800 years. Moses said that if we live to 80 years, even those 80 years, there's, there's a lot of <laughs> trials in those 80 years. Most live to 70, but if you live to 80, even in those 80 years, there's trials. So having known that life is, is short, 70, 80 years, how ought we to use the time that we've been given the wisest thing really to do is to grow in God. That's the wisest thing to do because all other things, everything that's seen is temporal. The things that are unseen are eternal. So let's quickly go to second. I think this is actually, that's actually the scripture, second Corinthians four verses 18. So I won't go to it, but I'll just paraphrase it again. Second Corinthians four eighteen is the things which are seen are temporal. Okay. So your money that you make, the relationships that you might enjoy, the status that you might possess, the houses that you might build, things which are seen are temporal, the things that are unseen, like eternal life, like wisdom, like love, those things are eternal. John 6, verses 63. <clears throat> Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 
Matthew 5, verses... Oh, sorry, it's Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verses 19 onwards. It says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, but where thieves do break through, nor where thieves where thieves do not break through nor steal. Amen. You see, in this uh, in this environment here in the UK, inflation is so high. Inflation is like 10%, very high at the moment. So if you put your money in a bank, your money is losing value every month. Okay? And this is what Jesus is saying, that when you lay treasures on the earth, it says thieves break in and still it's it's losing its value. Okay. But anything that you do for God, any good work that you do for God, it can be something as small as even Jesus said that if you give water to a prophet, if you receive a prophet into your house, little things like that, Jesus said that you will not lose your reward for that. Okay. Anything that you do for your brothers and your sisters that is good, you don't lose your reward for that. Jesus said that he he went to a group of people and he said, well done, enter into kingdom. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you were praying for me. And they say, when did we do that? We never saw you. You said, that which you've done to the least of my brethren, you have done also to me. So when you do good to people, especially those who are in the faith, your brothers and sisters in the faith, when you do good to them, you will never lose your reward for that. It's not like God is going to forget the good things that you have done. God will, God will list them down and write them down. And when you get to heaven then God will reward you. And Jesus is, Jesus is only instructing us about this because he cares about us. He wants us to be rich in the kingdom. He wants us to have real riches, not fake riches. Money is going to come and go. If God blesses you with prosperity, hallelujah. I'm for prosperity. But... Which one's more important, the spiritual prosperity, which will which will abide with me forever after I die? <laughs> because after we die, would unless Jesus Christ comes back anytime soon, would there not be many more generations? We will die just like our fathers died, our forefathers died, our grandparents died, our great grandparents died. They will die. We will be like that as well. One day. So what's more important? The treasures that we leave on this earth or the treasures that we can take with us in the kingdom. It says, verses 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. Okay, notice it says the eye. It doesn't say the light of the body is the eye. So he's saying singular, the eye. What is, he, what is he talking about when he says the eye? He's talking about the eye of your, your mind. Okay, your mind has an eye. Okay? Some people call it the third eye, whatever it is, pineal gland. All it really means is what are you focusing on? Okay? Because just similarly like your eyes, they can focus on an object. If you want to watch the TV, your eyes need to focus on the television. If you want to watch a bird flying, you need to focus on that object in the air. That's what eyes do. Eyes are meant to focus in order to see things, in order to gain insight, revelation. They need to focus. Similarly, your mind has to focus. And Jesus is saying here that 
the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, okay, if your eye is single, focused on the kingdom, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, okay, if your eye is focused on the things of the world, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the darkness that is in you be darkness. Now, if therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, okay? So in the previous two verses, he's talking about how your eye needs to be single. And then now he's saying, look, you, you can't have two masters. Just like your eyes can't look at two different things at the same time. My eyes can't look at uh, the TV that's in front of me, but the wall behind me at the same time. My eye has to, my eyes can only look at what excuse me at one thing, and that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that you can't serve two masters. You can't you 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 can't your focus can't be on the world and your focus cannot be on God. You have to pick one, and that's why Jesus says in Revelation, He says, "If you're lukewarm, I will spew you out." You can't afford to be in the world but in Christ. You have to pick one of them. He said, "I would prefer you were cold." So Jesus even prefer Jesus prefers if you just say you know what I'm not I'm not going to fool myself I'm not going to do this Christian walk properly let me just let me just be worldly Jesus would prefer you 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 were just honest with yourself he said let me just be cold that's his own words he said I prefer you be cold or hot but if you're lukewarm if you're in the middle I'll spew you out and that's what he's saying here no man can serve two masters. Yeah, I'm just seeing your comment that's come up. It says, Arnold says, pretty much like, say, make your mind up or I'll pick for you. Exactly. That's what Elijah was doing. When Elijah, there's a story in the Old Testament of Elijah. He went to the children of Israel because they were serving Baal. It, at the time, there was a queen called Jezebel and they were all serving her God, Baal. And Elijah said to them, he said, pick today who you will choose. Is it God or is it Baal? You can't serve both of them. You have to pick one God. And that's what God is saying today. God is the same message. Is it the world? Do you love the world? Or do you love God? The Bible says that if any man love the world, he is an enemy of God. That's what it says in, somebody can maybe put the scripture up in James. And there's also a scripture in First John about that. That you can't have the that anybody who has the love of the world does not have the love of the father. So it's is one or the other. It says verse 24: No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the one other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Okay, and if we went all the way onwards but to verses 33, it says, But seek ye. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. Amen. We're going to look at one more scripture, then close. Let's go to Psalm 119. And then <laughs> I think for the last two studies, we've only been doing one sign. Okay, so this we've only looked at the eighth one. Maybe on, on Saturday, God willing, we'll look at the last sign that I have that the Holy Spirit is operating in your life. And thank you, Arnold. So um we have here James chapter 4, verses 4, and it says, You adult, sorry, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Amen. We need to understand this world, the way the system of the world is not God's system. What we see in the world is not God's system. The kingdom of God is going to be so different to what we see. You see how in this country in particular, you see many laws. And then many of these laws that we have, many of these laws that are legislated are completely against the Bible. In the kingdom of God, those laws that you read about, even in the Old Testament, Many of them will be put back in order. Even the laws about keeping certain feasts. You know, in this world, 
people keep Easter, people keep Christmas. In God's kingdom, people will not be keeping those customs. It will be the customs that are in the Bible, like Pentecost, Tabernacle, uh, Tabernacles. People will be probably be keeping the Sabbath. People will be keeping the, the laws that are in the Bible, not, not the laws that are in this world. But Christianity, a lot of Christianity has become merged with the world. And so that is one way Satan has been able to trap a lot of people by merging the religion that is Christianity with the world. Many people have become friends of the world and they don't know that they're at enmity with God, even though they believe in Jesus. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, come out from her, my people. Come out from her, my people, and be holy. And I will receive you and you will become my people. Even music, it de well, it depends on the type of the music, obviously, isn't it? Best type of music, if you like a sort of rhythm, maybe listen to the instrumental of it. The If the song has is glorifying things that we know are ungodly, using terms and encouraging a lifestyle which is ungodly then we have to we have to say no to that music if you like the sound then just listen to the instrumental okay amen so let's just go to yeah so satan used psalm 91 against christ it's true the devil knows scriptures and uses it against us we saw it as an example of christ and Jesus countered with Deuteronomy. Amen. Yeah, he used Deuteronomy 6, he used Deuteronomy 4, and no, Deuteronomy 8 as well against him. Amen. Let's quickly go to Psalm chapter 119. I think this is like the longest chapter in the Bible, but don't worry, we won't read all of them. Psalm 119, verses 97. We'll start from 97 to 104. It says, oh, how I love your law. So this, this, this whole chapter, read it in your own time, Psalm 119. This is an example of somebody who is spiritually minded. This is King David. Now, as I said to you earlier on, don't get me wrong. To be spiritually minded, if you're spiritually minded, it doesn't mean God will not bless you with good things. In fact, God may even bless you more with good things because you're spiritually minded. Because now he can entrust you with these things. Because so, so many people, you see them in the industry, Desmond's talking about music. How many people in the music industry have sold their souls? How many people in the music industry have got all the things of this world and yet they've lost their souls? And what did Jesus say? Who would, what would it profit a man to gain this whole world and to lose your soul? There's loads of people that have done that. So is it really worth it to have all those things and then to lose out in Christ? But for some people, if if they've been tested and they, their focus is in Christ, in God, then God may entrust them with, with things. Just like uh, the, the person that had five talents, he multiplied it, and then God entrusted him with more talents. That's what God can do. And I'm saying that because David is an example of somebody who was very blessed, but we see the reason of why he was blessed. He wasn't born into riches. He wasn't born into blessedness. He was a simple shepherd. He wasn't esteemed amongst his brothers. He was one of the youngest. He wasn't particularly big or strong, but he had a good heart. And so God used him and God raised him up to become a king. So it's about being spiritually minded. If you want to go anywhere in this life and in the life to come, we have to develop that appetite for spiritual things. We must be more focused on spiritual things. We're just going to read these few verses from verses 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through the, thy commandments, has made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep your word. 
I have not departed from your judgments, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Let me read a few more verses. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me or revive me, Lord, according to your word. Accept, I beseech you, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from your precepts. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined mine heart to perform your statutes always, even unto the end. Amen.